look at the French theorist Jean Baudrillard. Now Jean Baudrillard, he was a sociologist and philosopher and cultural theorist. He's best known for his analyses of media, contemporary culture, technological communication, as well as his formulation of concepts such as simulation and hyperreality. He was born in July 1929 and he died in March 2007. So the key idea for Jean Baudrillard is that the proliferation of information technology alienates man from real lived social existence, forcing him to enter a new media-induced reality known as hyperreality. Hyperreality is characterised by the collapse of the distinction between the real and the simulated and the predominance of the simulacrum. And his most famous book is The Consumer Society from 1970. So like Marx, in the consumer society, Jean Baudrillard is preoccupied with the economy. But Baudrillard shifts from manufacturing to information-based industry, the characteristics of the emergence of postmodern society. However, it's at the point with which engagement with the economy becomes more tangible at the level of consumer than producer that is most important. This inaugurates a new sensibility whereby the consumption of goods is indivisible from the signification of identity. Baudrillard calls this semiotic landscape hyperreality. A good example of hyperreality is Disneyland. And Baudrillard famously once said that Disneyland only existed to convince Americans that the rest of America was real. While Baudrillard rejected the vision of this explored in the 1990 film The Matrix, the film The Full Monty arguably presents an account of how we got there, the decline of heavy industry and the collapse of traditional values and roles. For Baudrillard, ambience is also a key concept in postmodernity. This, he believes, is a function of a society in which mankind is alienated from each other. So a good example of this is Starbucks, where people go in and they enjoy the cosy lighting and the warm feeling of inclusion. So he says, the concepts of environment and ambience have undoubtedly become fashionable only since we've come to live in less proximity to other human beings. In their presence and discourse, and more under the silent gaze of deceptive and obedient objects which simultaneously repeat the same discourse, that of our stupefied power, of our potential affluence and of our absence from one another. Illustrative of this is the grouping of consumer products, not in relation to their use or function, but according to their ambience. Exemplary of this is the well-known advertisement for French soft cheese, which reads, du vin, du pain, du boursin. Unified only by their transposition into a foreign language, which in itself connotes sophistication, the three items, bread, wine and cheese, create a potent new symbol of rustic French cuisine that is almost biblical in its simplicity. The importance of ambience for Baudrillard is predicted on the collapse of the relationship between the signifier and the signified, the real and the simulated, and the emergence of a new sign, the simulacrum. The production of the simulacrum, or copy without an original, is one of the key theoretical issues in popular music studies. In particular, the blurring of the distinction between the real and the simulated. Some argue that musical recordings are the epitome of the postmodern text. Other thinkers have tried to identify key moments in the history of popular music when it seemed to embody postmodern cultural practice, e.g. the advent of digital sampling or the proliferation of music video in the 1980s. The problem, it would seem, is that it's impossible to find a pre-postmodern moment. From the gramophone to YouTube, popular music culture is inherently synthetic. So something to think about here is the reason we fetishise vinyl. Something that became relatively obsolete in the 1990s now has this tremendous um, object fetishism. And part of the reason for that, perhaps, is that it reconnects with this idea of authenticity which seems less postmodern than consuming things on Spotify. In Baudrillard's logic, we've reached a point where the whole of modern life is commoditized in ways that are characteristic of the shopping mall and the modern airport. One of the things I always think about this is the way we behave in airports. Quite often we purchase things we wouldn't normally buy, we buy things on credit cards where perhaps normally we would pay cash. And so 
there is this sense in which when we're in an airport we're slightly disinhibited and that really is kind of the aim of consumer culture perhaps to make us feel like we are in this very manufactured dream-like experience so all activities are sequenced in the same combinatorial mode where the schedule of gratification is outlined in advance one hour at a time when the environment is complete completely climatized burnished and culturalized the problem with this according to Baudrillard is that no human desire and aspiration is restricted to the desire to possess what other people have individualism is seen as in no way contradictory to the resembling everybody else so this is something that Nespresso have exploited in the marketing and um, design of their product have the different Nespresso capsules which give people the illusion of choice when in actual fact it's perhaps quite minimal difference between the flavours and the end product. An example of this is when we go and choose a car and the idea of the colour making the distinction when in actual fact the product is identical. The reason for the success of consumer culture in Baudrillard's logic is twofold. In the first instance, consumerism offers the promise of total fulfilment. Secondly, consumer culture constitutes a new and authentic language. So when we think about the different brands, how easily we recognise those brands to do with the colour, to do with the font. And also we make assumptions about people, we make assumptions about ourselves in the way in which our sense of identity interacts with those brands. So in this sense, Consumer culture constitutes a language in its own right. Moreover, consumerism is perceived as a harmless way in which the individual expresses his ego. That said, Baudrillard argues that consumerism is as meaningful as any other human interaction. Therefore, the way in which we use branding is kind of similar to the way in which we use other things that communicate our sense of identity and our meaning to other people and our sense of self and our position in relation to society and culture. However, perhaps where Baudrillard is most instructive is in his assertion that the relationship between the order and objects and human interaction. Objects are categories of objects which quite tyrannically include categories of persons. They undertake the policing of social meanings and the significations they engender are controlled. Their proliferation is simultaneously arbitrary and coherent is the best vehicle for social order, equally arbitrary and coherent to materialise itself effectively under the sign. Affluence. So this system, this language of consumers and this language of brands, what Baudrillard is suggesting is that while it offers us the opportunity to express ourselves, it also controls us. So within consumer society, the notion of social status and social standing are in this sense one and the same. As Baudrillard states, there is no real responsibility without a Rolex watch. As a code then, the system of objects underpinning consumer culture may appear to be transparent. However, it conceals, according to Baudrillard, the real relations of production and social interaction. A clear example of this would be the way that companies like Reebok and Nike market premium brand sportswear. In the first instance, the purchase of branded sports items appeals to the individual's desire to be different. To purchase a Nike or Reebok product is to distinguish oneself from individual sporting, generic and non-branded items yet these items are not exclusive. They are in fact mass produced and the purchase of such an item does not make the individual more unique but more ordinary. The myth however that both Nike and Reebok are selling is the myth of total fulfilment and the opportunity to participate in the dominant sign system of contemporary culture branded consumer goods. This expression of ego in the form of purchasing sportswear is however relatively harmless and comes with minimal risk. In addition to this, the meaning of the item is in dialogue with the social standing of the purchaser. For example, if the consumer is an accomplished sports person, then the object confirms this. If the person is less able, then the item confers the potential for achievement, the virtual opportunity for success. In this sense, the type of sports one they possess determines the social position of the individual. The concealed international dimension underpinning the labour relations involved in the production of branded sportswear for multinational corporations, however, evidences that this code is less transparent than it might first appear. Many companies like Nike and Reebok locate factories in the developing world where production costs are cheaper and working conditions are less heavily regulated. As Baudrillard suggests, however, this power dynamic is completely concealed in the semantics of Western consumer culture.
So in summary, Jean Baudrillard, the key idea, the proliferation of information technology alienates man from real lived social existence, forcing him to enter a new media induced reality known as hyperreality. Hyperreality is characterized by the collapse of the distinction between the real and the simulated and the predominance of the simulacrum.